So Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse has hit theaters. Just a couple days ago, I put out my spoiler-free review. This is our spoiler-filled discussion and review. If you haven't seen it, go ahead and click on over to that spoiler-free review. As for now, we're gonna get started in talking spoilers. Hi, my name is Sean Chandler. And I'm Andy. And we love to talk movies and comic book characters way too much. Some of you guys have been wondering, when is Andy gonna start a channel ever since I brought him on several months back? The answer is a couple weeks ago. He has a channel up. You can find it down in the description down below if you want to check out his channels, the videos that he's putting up over there. His channel is called... King's Comics. And it is all about comics and comic book movies, all of the fun stuff that we are talking about inside of this video. With that said, go ahead and tell us your thoughts on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse down below in the comment section. And as this is a spoiler video, Spoil away, no spoiler warnings required, just go for it, it is in the title. People should have clicked away if they don't want stuff spoiled, or they should never should have clicked on this video in the first place. Right. And with that in mind, you guys know what I thought about it, because I already posted my spoiler free review, and as well as my Spider-Man ranking. What was your takeaway as the comic book fanatic that have actually read these comics that some of these characters are coming from? Well, How was this for you? I, post, I uh, posted a spoiler-free review as well. That's got my initial thoughts, but for the people who haven't watched it, I love this. I think it's maybe one of the best, if not the best, Spider-Man movie I've seen. You've got these references to the Raimi Spider-Man movies, even like the Andrew Garfield movies, even the uh, memes online and the, uh, the PS4 game. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just chock full, even within the first five to ten minutes of all these references, uh, parodying, but also celebrating just right. Spider-Man's history. Well, they're like us. It's yeah. like the writers know the way we interacted with Spider-Man in mainstream culture, oh, yeah. what moviegoers know about the video games, the movies, all that stuff. They know what our jokes are, yeah. and so they're one of us throwing that in there. Oh yeah, and I mean, you can just tell there was such a love that was imbued in this film, but it's also, I think one of the people involved in the production was uh, Phil Lord, yep. the guy who did uh, the Lego movie, right? Uh, I think Miller wrote the script. Yes, yes, yeah. And that, I mean, you can tell just by the way these guys handled the Lego movie that they've got a lot of attention to detail. They grew up with things like Spider-Man and the Lego, so they have an inherent love for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is just beautiful. Right, and that just, and the intelligence and this out of the box type of storytelling, yeah. the taking the um, creativity of the like the mechanisms that they used with Legos, the unique way people interact with Legos, they brought that into the movie. That same sentiment that they used yes. to make that movie so distinct and unique, that's what they did with this one, except yes. with comic books and the Spider Man mythology, but in a totally different way. It doesn't feel like the Lego movie at all, right. but it has that same just spark of creativity um, that brought that film to life. And actually, one other thing that I noticed, it's uh, I mean, it kind of shows what kind of age we're in, right? Is the fact that most of the Spider Man in this movie came out within the past decade, you know, so it's not just about Peter Parker anymore. And when it is, we see two different Peter mm -hmm. Parkers. So, I mean, we get Spider Gwen, we get Spider, we get uh, Spider Man Noir. I mean, the fact that we've got all these Spider-Men coming into the film that have come out in the past couple of years, and they make us care about each single one of them and their stories, it's just really amazing. Right, and I, I know for me, like, I'm, I, I haven't followed reading normal or recent comic books. I've got graphic novels in the past. That's where I grew up with stuff. And right. so I normally go to a lot of the classic stories. And so I'm not really familiar with the Spider-Verse side of things. Oh, yeah. And so then even when people are like, they should do a Miles Morales movie, when they said that like a year ago, like, I don't know if you can do a mainstream yeah. live action Miles Morales movie. What this movie does is it changes my perception and the general public's perception of like, oh, this is who this character is. It brings him into the mainstream side by side with Peter Parker and not in a way that puts Peter Parker down. It's not a competition. Yeah. It just celebrates the Spider-Verse. Well, you can do so many different things with Spider-Man. Well, and that's what's interesting, because you say it doesn't uh, put Peter Parker down, right? But that's uh, kind of the beauty of how they parallel yeah. this, uh, mm -hmm. this ultimate Spider-Man, uh, voiced by Chris Pine. You know, and then the uh, the Spider-Man we see as a mentor to Miles Morales. Yeah, it's Peter B. Parker. Yes, voiced by uh, Jake Johnson. Is you see these two different versions of Spider-Man, uh, like one that's just very competent, got this down to a science, has his own lab, and then you see this other one who's going through a midlife crisis, a divorce, and trying to just get his crap together. And so, like, I went into the movie, uh, having seen the trailers, and yeah. I was like, Peter Parker's a slob. Yeah. And then, like, the one that really upset me was, like, I saw, uh, and I wish I hadn't seen it, but yeah. there was a clip of the divorce. 
And yeah. so I saw that there was going to be a divorce, and I was like, if that's where they're going with this, like, I know a lot of people are loving this movie, but, like, I, you just can't screw around with certain yeah. types of this, and you don't need to, like, try and make it edgy or whatever they're doing. So I went in pretty, like, where, where are they going with this? And I loved what they did yes. with Peter B. Parker because it wasn't an attack on Peter Parker. Right. It was an exploration of what would happen if there was a Peter Parker that was, he was still true to Peter Parker, right. but something went wrong. Actually, uh, and I will kind of bring this up, maybe there's a little bit more of a deeper dive, but one thing I noticed is with that Peter Parker storyline, it mirrors uh, one of the most controversial arcs in Spider-Man history, which came out after Civil War. It's called, I think if I remember, the uh, Brand New Day arc, which is where uh, Aunt May does die during Civil War, after Civil War, but then uh, basically with a deal with Mephisto, this uh, demon from, you know, this demon, he divorces Mary Jane in order to bring Aunt May back to life. So I'm going to go ahead and say they handled it a little bit better in the movie. There's a reason that some of these comics don't appeal to me. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's just kind of start over. Let's go back, yeah, just kind of right. like kick it off from the beginning of the movie, kind of walk through it in sorts. Uh, so it kicks off with Peter Parker kind of given, and it starts off this recurring joke throughout of it, which is like, we're going to tell this story <laughs> one, one, last, last one, 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 one last time. Is what I think it says every time. One last time. You know the story. I was bit by a Parker. It, uh, Bit by uh, by <laughs> but so it um, so it goes into his story yeah. and, and it has all this is where it has all these great references to the Raimi film. Oh yeah, you got him doing his little dance and thing. Then, and and then like the kiss upside down, the the train sequence. I mean it touches on literally the most memorable iconic things of each of those three movies. Oh, yeah. And then it goes from there and we just this classic romanticized version of Spider-Man and then it kicks off into Miles Morales. And right off the bat, when the animation started at the beginning, I was nervous. Yeah. Because really? especially when uh, Miles Morales starts and has him in his room and has like this nice little scene. It's like yeah. he feels like such a, uh, a 13 year old or 14 year old. Well, you even hear him like kind of mumbling. Through, and like mm -hmm. it's hard to pick up at first, but you hear him mumbling through the song a little bit, which was really, it took a second to click, but it was really well pulled off. You felt yeah. like he was a kid. And so it establishes really quickly who he is, his parents, the dynamics of everything. But back to the animation, it is this low frame rate yes. to it that I was like, from the trailer, I was like, that looks really cool, but I'm curious where this is going. And so at the very beginning, especially like when he jumps out of it, leaves right. his apartment, he goes down the steps, it looks real jerky. Well, and, you and I was about, nervous. And you heard about, uh, I was reading up on this. Did you hear about, that was like an intentional choice is a, uh, because they did stuff like that, it made it feel a little bit more comic book. Oh, absolutely, I mean, yeah. absolutely. So where I'm going with this is like, at the beginning, I was nervous. That like, am I just gonna be paying attention to the right. jerkiness of this? And for me, I, had, I adjusted by about 10 minutes. Like I, I, I remember it, like the first five, 10 minutes thinking like, hmm, and around 10 minutes, I didn't think about it again until about oh, yeah. an hour and 45 minutes into it. I was like, wait, I haven't thought about how the animation is and it looks great. Right. So tie it back to animation. The style of this thing is phenomenal. Of like, the, yeah. their, the low frame rate, the putting the words on the screen, yeah, the way they did everything. Yeah, you just, I mean, they fully embrace the fact that this came out of a comic book. We're not necessarily trying to adapt anything too, too much. We're just doing as much as we can. A translation. Yes. As opposed yeah. to an adaptation in a way great that, way um, it. That uh, Ang Lee tried to do with his Hulk movie. Oh yeah, and uh, um, and like obviously that movie, it, it didn't pay off with that film. And that movie has other problems besides the direction, but um, <laughs> many right. problems beyond that. But it, this movie doesn't like the no. the stuff that you, was done in that movie that was like oh Ang Lee's Hulk. Here it just works. Yes, and it like in a way that you've never seen it before. Like, um, uh, actually, <laughs> uh, to to reference this book that's right here. Yeah. Um, so the guy that got me into movie reviews is Leonard Maltin. So I've got a ton of his movie review guides. He posted his review of it, and he said, and he's seen he's literally seen about twenty thousand movies in his lifetime, and reviewed twenty thousand movies in his lifetime. Good night. And he tweeted out like, I've never seen an animated film like this before. This yeah. is the most spectacularly animated film I've ever seen. Seventy years old or something like that. Well, and most importantly, uh, so I then retweeted him and he retweeted me back. So <laughs> Leonard Malton, my movie reviewing um, crush, has retweeted me. Um, did I refer to him as my crush? That was a strange direction to take that. Anyway, sorry about the side note there. Back to the movie. Movie, yeah. Miles Morales, talk about uh, it. Not just Miles Morales. I mean, they have all these different Spider-Men coming in, and it's weird because with Miles Morales, like, he comes into the fray in the comics after Peter Parker dies, except Peter Parker is 
still high school age in the comic, right? But the interesting part is he still had to do the whole traditional Spider-Man thing where he has to come into his own right. He's got Nick Fury pouring into him because Nick Fury feels guilty about Peter Parker's death in the comics. You've even got Aunt May, Gwen Stacy, and Mary Johnson. Um, Mary Jane, help, Mary Johnson, Mary Jane helping him in the comics. But in this story, in the movie, we see all these different extra dimensional Spider-Man helping him out as well, which you actually don't see in the Spider-Verse event in the comics. But either way, it just felt like this young kid yeah. trying to like emulate his hero, but also trying to deal with the weight of what it means to be Spider-Man. And one of the things they do with him is, uh, so he's middle school. Yes. And... He's like a middle schooler, especially at the beginning of it. He's walking around and we can see his thoughts and everything like that. And like all middle schoolers, he thinks everyone's staring at him. Yeah. And sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. And he's not self-aware. And then he's over, overly self-aware. Just the way middle schoolers are. And they, they, they don't know how to relate to other people. And they're yeah. so awkward and uncomfortable and self-absorbed in the weirdest and worst ways. That's what he does in the movie. Well, and it also captures this as a way, of, you know, just um, adolescence of being in middle school or high school of not really appreciating where your parents are coming from mm -hmm. and what they're doing because he's embarrassed of his dad, you know, who's a cop. who's trying to do all these good things to just be a good example and role model for him. But then he just looks up to Aaron Davis, who for the first part of the movie, we think is just kind of this burnout. And we find out he's uh, the prowler. And we find out he's... He's very successful at something. Yeah. He, he just couldn't tell his <laughs> officer or brother about it. He's right. so wildly successful. He's a super villain. Oh, yeah. He's who the kingpin goes to yes. when he needs a job Yes. Done. Like, this is a guy that... It's a tragedy that in life, people didn't realize all that he offered the world. And actually, I will point out another fact is maybe some people picked up on this, but Aaron Davis is in the MCU. We see him in Spider-Man Homecoming, mm -hmm. portrayed by Donald Glover. Mm -hmm. AKA Childish Gambino. And if you watch the ex, uh, the, um, oh wow, what am I looking for? The, uh, deleted scenes. Deleted scenes. scenes. Yes. You see him on the phone while he's stuck to the car calling Miles Morales, like saying, Hey Miles, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to make it. So Miles Morales does <laughs> exist in the MCU mm -hmm. as far as we know. Uh, so then the story progresses. They go spray painting stuff. Spider lowers down. Yes. Bites him. A nice little scene where it like, just like zooms in on his hand as things are happening and then he just... And yeah. it moves on like nothing happened. I thought that was also another thing. Is um, You've always got this sense in each of the movies, uh, you know, the Raimi movies or the uh, Andrew Garfield movies where they clearly change... Uh, their body clearly changes, mm -hmm. except they usually show it as like, you know, just some jacked guy, you know, taking off his shirt. But in this one, you see he gets taller, mm -hmm. right? His pants don't fit anymore. Like, they didn't really have to address, you know, this is a jacked 13-year-old, which would have right. been a much different conversation. Yes. Um, and so then he transforms, goes to school, fun conversation with uh, Gwanda. Gwanda. <laughs> Gwanda, where even she, like, she's a little bit older, but she's also... She's not a grown-up. She right. also behaves like a teenager that's kind of weird, doesn't know how to respond to someone, and so says weird stuff. I was also really surprised because, you know, in the trailer we see her have this kind of punky haircut, you know, like with the side of her uh, head shaved off, which is funny because in the comic Spider-Gwen, you know, she's in a punk rock band like you see. She's much more free-spirited and punky, but in the trailer, that made sense to see that, but in the movie, we see that that's yeah. completely T ties, accidental. Ties into so many other things. I actually saw some people online like, I wish I had her haircut, <laughs> but do you want to get the haircut the way that she got the haircut? Do you want a young adolescent spider boy tearing your hair off? Nice. So then he tries to experiment, trying to figure out his powers, doesn't yeah. go, or well, actually, that's out of order. So he goes to try and see where this all this came from. This is where he sees Peter yeah. Parker in action. We are introduced to our collider thing, because we got a little bit out of order, but, um, and in this, like, they go all out in, yeah. in a PG movie, not PG-13, PG movie, oh, man. Kingpin, yeah. smash kills uh, uh, Peter, Spi Parker. Peter Parker. Spider-Man is smash killed like that, and so then he has to become Spider-Man while being a little kid that doesn't know what to do with that. And so he's like sitting on the sidelines. Like he's yeah. got powers and he's like, I don't, I can't die, jump into this. I can't go. Like, well, I'm just a little kid. I think it was also brutal because you have like three main, just powerful Spider-Man villains around. You've got the Kingpin, you've got Green Goblin, who's like this awesome dragon thing. And then you've got a, a Tombstone, like just all around him. And Kingpin's the one who ends it. Like that was just so, oh, and Prowler, of course. But it was just so brutal <laughs> because of how angry yeah. you could tell Kingpin was. Uh, and, so, and then foreshadowing his kind of where his character's coming from with the family. Oh so then gosh, yeah. next day we get Miles. He's experimenting with his stuff. 
and falls down on the ground and breaks the chip. Which I like when I first you saw the it, goober. The goober. He breaks the goober. So he. This happens. When I first saw it, I was like, R- "Would he have it in his pocket? Like, does this really make a lot of sense?" And I stopped to think about it. And went, "Yeah, because he's not me. <laughs> he is not." 37 years old. He's not a grown man. He's a 13 year old boy boy that would do something like, oh yeah, I'll just put this in my pocket and now I'm going to go jump off a building. (laughs) He's not going to think about it. He doesn't know any better. And that has consequences. And so then goes to the the grave site and then Peter B. Parker shows up. Yeah. Okay. Kicking off. Um, and then we get to see the next origin story, which that one was a lot more, I guess, just visceral and brutal for me. Because, you know, in the comics, you've got the Parker look, right? You've got this Peter Parker who's always kind of beat down. Something bad happens to him. But this was just like over the top. You know, yeah. I'm with you. It just felt like too much. Yes. Woo. Better get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> So he gets divorced, <laughs> loses, it, gets fat, <laughs> loses his money. Um, oh, he's yeah. like, I was I always know. doing push-ups, and show me eating beats. I handled it. I got divorced, but I handled it like a champ. <laughs> um, and so then we get the two of them meeting up, and you you get this guy that has the Peter Parker charm, the quick wit. He's got all of that. Yeah. But there, like, there's just something like this that is broken inside of him. It's this oh. character flaw that has made him off. And even though he still wants to be a hero, he's not like, like he's not totally selfish, he's not totally off. He also has something about him that's just making him head in these weird directions. Yeah. Which just makes for a really interesting little relationship. And so we get the fun times with them uh, sitting at a diner eating food. (laughs) Well, and that's also kind of an interesting point, right? Because there is this little implication that his character would have just kind of continued in this uh, stagnant, like downward spiral if he hadn't had the events of this movie happen to him. You know, And that's that's kind of the the idea of great storytelling is that the best stories you want to craft a character that this story needs to happen to them so yes. that they can be who they need to be or to discover who how bad they really are. Like the story is required to truly expose what's going on underneath. And that's what makes for really powerful storytelling is you yeah. have this Parker that you see him at the beginning and I'm like, oh, you can't, you can't have Peter Parker divorce. You can't yeah. do, that. you can't, like this is disrespectful. And then through the course of the story, you go, no, he is that guy before and he wants to be him again. And they it only took like this one little line at the, like right before he jumps in, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but one little line of him saying like, but what if I screw it up again? And yeah. you go, and it makes so much of a difference for his character for the movie. Oh, absolutely. But it's also this idea that um, it's easy to focus on Miles Morales coming. I think it's, like that's the point is it's easy to focus on Miles Morales coming into his own as Spider-Man, but it's hard to focus on Peter Parker, the grown man, having his own character development arc mm-hmm. because it's kind of like subverted when he's just kind of this, uh, I don't know, this Mr. Miyagi, you know, who's just, Mr. Miyagi, who's just kind of done with everything, mm-hmm. not wanting to train another Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. He's just good to go. Yep, and and like it's not him becoming a hero because he's like, oh yeah, I've got this, and like I'll just go in there, I'll do 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 do. I know what I'm supposed to do. Like it's him like getting the switch to go back on and caring and to like be checked in. And that's like, that's the other interesting part, right? Is because he's still very much Spider-Man. Like you said, he knows what he's doing. He just knocks it out, but he's still having to watch out for miles. So you get the sense that he's a very competent hero. He just, like you said, he just needs that flip switch. Yeah. And so then they decide, all right, we're going to team up. We got to break into this lab. They go there and he's like, all right, my plan, I got to go in there. I'll just grab this, grab this doodle, grab a bagel on the way out and head on out. Uh, Wonderful little scene. And so they end up heading in there. They get into the office and then we discover Miles has some new powers. Oh, yeah. And then, ta-da! Actually, that is another thing. So there's this kind of minor debate in the comics about the fact that, one, a lot of people like his ability to turn invisible. But we also saw his Venom Blast, right, where he gets the electricity and he can kind of zap people. A lot of people in the comics feel kind of uh, split on that because they feel it's kind of just over the top, overpowered. Like, he's able to take on Green Goblin with it or these just huge villains. Like, we saw him take the Kingpin out with it to yeah. jump ahead. But, like, a lot of people are kind of mixed on that because they feel it's overpowered. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it, though. It was good to see him develop these powers and learn how to actually use them. Feels a little bit to me like it's this, this sort of thing. Like if my son were like, "What if we had a new Spider-Man?" And he's like, "Okay, what if he's even younger and he can turn invisible and he can zap people?" Oh, That's yeah. what my, my like Liam, my six-year-old, would come up with. So I tend to be on the side like, 
Eh, I'm not. I'm not crazy when you're trying to like. And how do you make Spider-Man even cooler? But, and then you just give him crazy powers. But to be fair, so this is all set in the Ultimate Universe, and the person who wrote started writing um, Ultimate Spider-Man, Brian Michael Bendis. He's actually the one who ended up creating. Uh, Miles Morales as well. So I think part of that was this transitional state of creating, you know, having Peter Parker die, creating a new Spider-Man, but also saying, okay, how do we how do we differentiate this one from Peter? Give Parker? him a stinger, like uh, yeah, I mean, you well, have venom in you now or to something. To be fair, they already they already did that with Peter Parker in the uh, main Spider-Man. I don't know, man. But that's like. Like a spider that's shooting electricity? Like, what? Yeah, I mean, but you know, in the main comics, you do have Peter, it's 616 universe, you do have Peter Parker, there's this weird arc where he can create organic webs, he can like create these like stingers out of them. They dialed back on that eventually, but I mean, it's the ultimate universe where they were trying to be edgier, they were trying to do different things, so it kind of fits with the tone. I do like the ultimates. Yes, because yeah, exactly. One and two, three, I, th my, my, I haven't read that one, but I heard it goes off the rails. Um, yes, like Hawkeye's got armor, and like there's just a lot more edgy stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, but, you know... The but the ultimates one and two, that is where the Avengers came from, as well as uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Nick Fury. That's where that oh, yeah. originated come from. Anyway, we're talking about the wrong thing. Yes. So then they come across the Doctor, mm. who is very curious about them, and is like looking into them, researching them. Uh-oh, turns out Doc Ock. And and Gosh, so that was incredibly. I I thought the Prowler twist. I mean, you know, knowing the Prowler twist was me just sitting in my seat, just kind of shrugging. Not in a bad way. They did it very well. But just like when people were shocked, it's like, yeah, guys, like this is okay. I mean, I and I had to contain myself. But the Doc Ock twist that was incredibly well done. I didn't even. I had no idea that's where it was going. And so then he's putting on the charm, and then she's like, "Do you? You're glitching. Does that hurt?" I can't wait to watch. And so then eventually they break out of it. They're running through the hallway. Spider, uh, uh, Spider Morales is carrying both the monitor and both the computer. I got good news. <laughs> you don't need the monitor. <laughs> Which, once again, it's like such like a little kid thing to like, I better grab all of this. <laughs> and then the grown up being like, You've got monitors elsewhere on the planet. <laughs> and, takes, and then they're, they're running through the hallways. They go into the kitchen. Grabs his bagel. And there's every freaking employee that this, like there's every employee just ready to blast their heads off. And Man. then they jump outside and like a good coach, he tells them the best way to learn is to just go in head first and throws them off. They start, eventually starts to figure out just a little bit. They start swinging through the forest. Oh, yeah. They get themselves in still a little bit of trouble because of the glitching. And then as we- As well as uh, you've got Doc Ock chasing them still. Doc Ock's chasing them. And then- we get a new spider person, Spider-Gwen shows up. And with her, we get another yeah. origin story. Actually, that is something that isn't, I don't know if people picked up on it, but in her origin story, we see her fighting this huge hulking beast. And it turns out that's Peter Parker. In the Spider-Gwen universe, uh, Peter Parker, instead of becoming Spider-Man, becomes the lizard. And so when she's fighting him, he dies in the process. So she actually becomes this uh, villain, this vigilante that is hunted, pursued by the cops. One of them being uh, Frank Castle, the Punisher. Nice. In this universe. Fun. So then um, we get another person thrown into the mix. They realize, or how do, what do we need to do about this? We got to put right. this goober together. We got to make a new one with this technology. So where are we going to head? Aunt May's. Aunt May's house. So they show up, and then you, you start to get. Um, We've had like sarcastic Peter people are corrupt to this point in time yeah. who's just cracking jokes about everything. I just want to get back to my world. And you have this first moment of like, oh, like this is a guy that's like pretty broken. Like yeah. he's pretty messed up. And he's like, I don't want to go inside because she's dead to him. Yeah. Um, and literally not as not metaphorically in a negative sense, but like this is just <laughs> like the, per like, oh, the person God. that he <laughs> took a dark turn. <laughs> like this person that he like most cares about in the world or one of the two people he cares about most about in the world died a few years back. He had the grieve process through that, and now she's going to be back. But, I mean, then you also get in this idea of him having to face his fears, you know, him mm -hmm. having to face the things that broke him in his reality. Mm -hmm. Once again, kind of subtle, kind of obvious at the same time, yeah. but still very well done. Very well done. So we go inside, and he's like, oh, I got a little shed, too. We got one of these. Yeah, nothing cool. You got a shed, and boom. <laughs> And they walk into it, and he's kind of pretentious. Yeah. It's, it's great little one-liners kind of thrown into Once there. Again, kind of another reference to, I mean, obviously just Spider-Man in general, but the, uh, you know, the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man, how he's just like chilling in his shed, just making technology. <laughs> Gosh. So we lower down, and... He's got the bat ca spider cave. Spider cave, and, you know, I, I just played through 
Spider-Man PS4. Yes. And so all the costumes are just oh yeah, you all across the back. And it's literally like, you can just go through it. Those are the costumes in yes. the game. And, well, oh. Not just in the game, right? Because these come from actual uh, Right, right. Well, of course, of course. Because um, uh, like Spider-Man, even since like the early days, he always creates like some spider suit or new technology because Peter Parker at his core is a scientist. So you always see that exercise when he's got a new villain coming. Even like the mattress suit that he created to fight Electro. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, but so I played through the game with my son. That's where the point of reference for us was right, like. Yeah. So I watched it with him Thursday night. And we're like, the, the cost is just, and it's just doing all this fun stuff. So we arrived down there and we meet some new people once again. Oh, man. And they just they go straight for it. We got Noir. We got um, uh, Spider Ham. We have Spider. Sp sp slash, I'm just going to say Spider. But uh, that one was actually written by Gerard Way, who's a huge anime fan. So in that comic, you see references to Neon Genesis, Evangelion, Akira, Ghost in the Shell. I mean, that's like my favorite, one of my favorite new Spider-Men. But either way, I love John Mulaney as Spider-Ham as well. I thought he played it off very well. But I think Nicolas Cage just pulled it off as Spider-Noir. <laughs> Sometimes I let matches burn to my fingertips just right. to feel something. <laughs> and that they found this, like, they found a tone in a world where you can go from quirky anime yeah. Penny Parker to noir, I just let matches burn, to my hands are wet because I just washed them. <laughs> no other reason. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, and they, they can pull that off. They can just go through that and it and it works. Yeah, but you also come into, you know, like uh, like Lena, uh, Leonard Malton was saying, like just the incredible animation quality, the fact that you had all these animation styles going on, like this anime influence, this uh, weird like monochromatic influence, this uh, weird like old cartoon style for Spider-Ham. Uh, and then the afters. And they're commenting on it too. Yes. We're like, is he in black and white? <laughs> I mean, even when he's just on the couch, like messing with the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> is, is this purple? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you were about to say the after credit sequence, we get uh, a couple more Spider Man in the end. Oh, yeah. You get the uh, animate, the original animated series Spider Man, and even goes to that comic book style. But then you uh, get Spider Man 2099, mm -hmm. which came out of the 90s when we were trying to be very, very, very edgy with mm -hmm. uh, these hero reinventions. Heck, even Doctor Doom and Deadpool get reinventions in the 2099 line. Yep. That was my era of going to comic book shops every Saturday with my sister. So we, uh, we bought those ones when they first came out off. The rack. It's actually interesting because there was another uh, Spider-Man animated series based on 2099. It was uh, Spider-Man Unlimited, if you ever watched that one. It was based on the 2099, but Spider-Man 2099 is uh, Miguel, Miguel O'Hara. You know, but uh, in Unlimited, it was still Peter Parker. He went to like a different planet or something. Either way, very interesting. So... They go down there, um, they need to come up with their plan. Hey, we gotta go in there, someone's gotta stay behind. Miles is like, hey, I can stay behind, this is my universe. And they kick and the th crap out of him. And then they're kind of negative towards him. <laughs> Granted, I'm a superhero and I've been a superhero for several years, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to make a plan to save the universe, mm -hmm. and a 13-year-old boy who's been less than consistent in his abilities. And like Spider-Man for all 48 hours, maybe. And he's like, no, I got this. I personally would be like, no, you don't. Yep. Let's come up with a new plan. So I get where they're coming from, but and so they start talking about him, and then they even call that out in the middle of it. Oh, he's looking at us while we talk. <laughs> they call it out in the middle of it. And so then he finally turns invisible and leaves. Yeah. Uh, feelings hurt and everything like that. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, that still, you know, maintains this uh, fight-and-flight response that, you know, was the passive nature of his powers to begin with. You know, it was like, it's clear his powers were very emotionally driven mm -hmm. at the start of the film. Well, and, I mean, like, up until the point where he finally learns to you know, um, just master them. Yep. So then he goes to uncle's house. Mm -hmm. Uncle comes home in his Halloween costume, but it's also his costume for his job yes. because he is a successful super villain as the Prowler. Oh, no. Plot twist. Uh, so this leads to a chase. He follows him back to the house. Actually, that comes up with a, another point, right? It's just how fearsome like these villains felt on screen. Like the Prowler just felt dangerous. I mean, yeah. just any scene he showed up in was frightening. Mm -hmm. And so a big fight breaks out. Yes. Once again, Miles is not doing the best in this sequence. No. Um, He's doing great at running away for the most part. For a little while there. And then we get to the roof and Prowler is about to kill this very small person. He's holding by the throat and pulls his mask off. And you go, oh, that's my... that's my nephew there. I'm not going to kill him. You're right. And so then Mr. Kingpin... 
just ends him. And uh, they, they also did a great job. Uh, they did a great job with the uh, just the emotion of that sequence. I mean, you f you feel that there's this internal struggle, but that he's ultimately not going to do it. He can't, but he knows yeah. Kingpin's watching. Yeah. Gosh. So uh, yeah. It was, so uh, then. Miles carries him down the road. His dad's already shown up investigating all this. So he just sees this yeah. new Spider-Man fly away as his, his brother's... Passing away. Yeah, you know, yeah, dying there. Um, and then, so once again, he already not liking Spider-Man, has more negative feelings towards Spider-Man. Miles goes back to his dorm room. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then he finds the other Spider-Man, like, waiting there for him or coming in because they want to, they just want to shut down this yeah. idea of him going to help him at the Super Collider. Uh, <laughs> that one. Yeah. They shoot him down. He's not happy about it. No. Um, not, not so much. And so he's got to dig down deep to kind of process all of this. Um, I mean, that's also where we see his, uh, his dad coming to his dorm room mm -hmm. and them, uh, I don't know, I thought it was also this kind of, I mean... I don't know. I don't know enough about film, but this interesting parallel of him and his dad on different sides of the door and the distance like between them, not just his father and son, but as like this officer of the law and Spider-Man. You know, I feel like there was a lot of mm -hmm. uh, metaphor there or something deep. Once again, I don't know. I don't review films or know a lot of tropes. And I'm stupid, so I, I don't. But yeah, I mean, they, they try to like find this way like to visualize the fact that there's this literal wall between the two of them and that they're not communicating very well. Yes. And so they put they put it all on the screen and put it all together. Miles kind of goes through this like, I, it's not just that I want to do this because I got powers. Right. Like, I need to really own this. And so then he goes sees Aunt May. He starts experimenting, practicing, starts to put things together. I also thought, like, in that scene, like, the creation of the costume was a really interesting take because... I mean, you've always got this idea that Spider-Man makes his own costume, but in the Ultimate Comics, I think uh, Shield gives him his costume as well as web spinners. But in this, t like in this case, you know, the old Spider-Man, the old Peter Parker, like kind of set him up for success here, and Aunt May helped him find that, you know, help mm -hmm. him with that journey. So, the people show up at the ball. Yep. Good thing it's a uh, Spider-Man themed. Wilson Fisk always liking to hide in uh, plain, uh, sight. plain sight, and so then we get this nice little moment as Peter B. Parker's walking through it and sees Mary Jane, and oh yeah, just kind of she's just out of bread, shuts down. Yep. And so then he apologizes profusely for like uh, not being there for her, and she's like, "That's okay." <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't know how to respond to him. But once again, it's him facing his fears, him processing through, saying all the things he couldn't say before right. in this, to a person that wouldn't understand it even if she could see his face. Oh, yeah. And more importantly, they're talking about bread, so she really doesn't get it. But it's this great little moment. Spider Gwanda pulls him away, and they go off on their little adventure, and she has to tell him, we're not going to get her bread. Yeah. And so she... <laughs> doesn't get her bread after all. Uh, and they head down into the basement to take on the collider. Yep. Captain Miles swings in into the fight, and, you know, we get kind of this all out. Everybody kind of gets that oh, little yeah. moment. Uh, this just insane. And it was also <laughs> crazy. just incredibly well. I mean, especially with the uh, different characterizations of these villains. Like, you have Green Goblin flying around. You have uh, this weird cyborg scorpion. It was just amazing. Which, it was interesting, uh, the kind of take on Scorpion being kind of, I don't know, this uh, Hispanic-looking uh, character with, like, his accent, too. Because that looked like the portrayal in uh, the MC, like in the MCU when we meet Matt Gargan for the first time in jail. But, I, I don't know, I thought just all the characterizations of these uh, villains was incredible. Just a good opportunity to reinvent them. Mm -hmm. And so, tons of stuff happening. All the characters kind of get some little fun moment in there, whether anvils falling on people's heads. Uh, one thing that I think that they didn't do particularly well is so Penny Parker, her robot dies. Yes. And they pause to have like this, like, like sorrowful moment of loss. Yes. But they didn't really set up the relationship there. Well, not just that, but that was a confusing component to me because at the end of the day, the. So the spider suit in the comic is, I mean, in and of itself, right? It's an inanimate object. Right? It's just a r robot. Yeah. But the uh, actual spider, like the pilot, is a symbiotic relationship between uh, the radioactive spider and the pilot. So uh, Penny Parker and formerly the spider and her dad. 
So theoretically, the robot actually had no emotional impact, so right. much as her and the spider. Because they show the spider come out. Exactly. And, so that part was a little confusing and misleading to me. Yeah, and it's like they were, they, were, they wanted to have some loss, some stakes, and have some sort of moment. Right. But I felt of the spider people, she was the one that got underserved the most. Like, yeah, she just I've, felt kind of a little bit in the background. Yes, absolutely. And, I mean, that's... I know. That's always a problem when you have... I mean, it's the same thing you see with Iron Man, like, especially in the comics, right? It's outside of the suit. What is he? I mean, because you need to have a way to make someone who pilots a robot or something kind of a threat on their own. Otherwise, there's no... I know. They have no, like, value yeah. to add. As soon as her robot's done in the fight, she's out. Yeah. And so I, I, I thought that could have... That's one of, like, of a movie that's almost all positives. Yes. That's one that I was like, ah, they, 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 they fumbled that one a little bit yeah. with, um, in all the way that was that was kind of handled. Through... Uh, I guess we learned this a little bit earlier, but... So we'll, we'll talk about Wilson Fisk. The other negative I have right. on the movie is Wilson Fisk. I hated the design. Real, uh, the, how, yeah. I mean... I felt like um, of all the designs in the this, movie... This wide... I just like, that's weird. What? He's a thick boy. I mean, but, you know. It just, looks so weird. It was, on I liked it a little bit, but at the same time, part of my problem is it didn't really sync up with the rest of the design right. in the film. Like, yeah. the Kingpin should always just be this hulking figure. Of course. Even, uh, even in the Daredevil show, they did a great job of, like, portraying his size and strength. But in this case, it just felt, like, really out of line with the and, rest. And there's parts that, like... And there's shots in it. Like, his shoulder block is literally just a straight line across the screen. I was like... I, this is odd. I, yeah. I just don't, I'm not buying it. Yeah. But the actual characterization, they yeah. get pretty heavy in the, the sort of idea of like, he's this selfish, villainous guy, but he so cares about his family, but not enough to let go of who he, like just this really yes. kind of nuanced take on who he is and, and the way he's designed. That's why, I mean, in the show and comics, like paralleling him and Daredevil, things like that is always a good, I know, just a strong character arc because of the fact that he either wants New York to be the best it can be by controlling crime and all that, while being a very evil, psychotic person who's d d willing to do what he wants, yeah. but also just loving his family, loving Richard and Vanessa, and that ultimately costing him when he tries to hide his dual life. Mm -hmm. And so then we see all this here. Yeah. Uh, and it's big, gigantic uh, battle breaks out. They get the button pushed. And so they start sending the people back through the portal. We get this great moment we referenced before with Peter B. Parker. It's like he keeps trying to stay behind. Like yes. he, he wants to stay. He kind of wants to die. Yes. Heroic. He wants to die heroic. But he, he doesn't know how to go back because he's right. afraid that he can't be the good Spider-Man. Like, he's afraid that he's going to fail again or get into these ruts or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, and then, like, Miles Morales isn't really this uh, mentor, right? But, like, more so this encourager saying, right. like, hey, man, you just did all this. Like, you know, you, you can handle this. I mean, not literally, but still. It was just encouraging to see that mm -hmm. he's going to go back. And we even see that when the film's closing mm -hmm. out, that he's going and seeing Mary Jane just trying to make amends. Yep. And just... It's the power of when you tell a story well and you craft your characters right, mm. they don't have to overplay it. They don't have to give a speech. He doesn't have to, like, lay out everything that he's thinking. Right. They've established that everything so well that one short little sentence that anyone can, can understand, like, what if I screw it up again? And then it's followed up by, like, you don't know. It's a leap of faith. Like, they just yeah. set it up so well, well and that it just it pays off. Yeah, it just pays off emotionally and absolutely works to give him a character arc to make you go, like, no, this is Peter Parker. This is true to him. They're not disrespecting him with all the, the, the slob, the divorce. This is a very cool thing that they were able to do that you could only do in a movie like this and it not be disrespectful and explore the character in a unique way. So just as I thought it, that I just love that character arc. And actually, there was something that I really loved. Like, I know people picked up on it. And in the comics, there's, like, a relationship, you know, like, a romantic relationship between Spider-Gwen and Miles Morales because they, like, cross over a couple more times from their different universes. But I really like that they didn't force a romance between Spider-Gwen and Miles Morales, especially because she's, like, 16, 17, and he's, like, 12 or 13. Hey, so we worked weird. with teenagers before. They do that all the time. And, and then we make fun of them for it. <laughs> or we do because we're as, terrible people. As well as have to like answer to their parents, which is even worse. <laughs> yes. uh, so many awkward moments in youth ministry. Yep. Anyway, back to the movie. And so then finally, Miles, Kingpin fight each other. Uh, Kingpin's about a, to take him out. 
and Papa shows up just to, just in the nick of time. And I, I we finally say, hear uh, we finally hear him like rooting on Spider Man yeah. after all these anti vigilante anti Spider Man uh, just kind of jeers in the film throughout the film. And so he t- he sees just enough. They're like, I, all right, there's there's times we need someone yes. that's not like they can do something the police can't do. Yes. There's stuff that's too weird for the police. It's not about replacing. It's it's not that we don't matter. There's crazy out there that's on a, a whole other level. Oh, absolutely. And so then he, he gets it. And so then we kind of close out the movie and um, uh, tie up our loose ends of him becoming Spider-Man. Just and feeling really good. Just Peter B. Parker bringing some flowers. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just closed out well. Um, I mean, has a lot of sequel potential. We all, we see this, like, you know, kind of end scene of um, uh Spider Gwen, like saying, "Hey, you got a minute, a mile," so like they can still communicate and things like that. It just, and then it closes out with, "And one last time, <laughs> you know the story," and it closes out. So, I think we both loved it. Yeah, it's just, it's without just, a doubt. Um, and beyond it just being a great movie, mm-hmm. I love that we have something so weird and but uh, mainstream you know? and like it's adventurous it's all these different words that normally you'd be like oh that's probably not going to be mainstream for audiences but no this is like anyone can enjoy this yeah, and not just that but the fact that they did they didn't just do one origin story which is always a complaint mm-hmm. about superhero films they did oh what six of them six of them and pulled it off i mean and had fun poking fun jennifer said this is her favorite movie of the year yeah, this um, is my wife. She's she never read a comic book. She like didn't know who Iron Man was before the movie Iron right. Man came out. This was her favorite movie of the year. I mean, this is hot take, hot take incoming. Um, it's either tied or better than Infinity War for me. Um, because Infinity War, we all saw it coming, and it like surprise, shock, and awe. But this, I mean, especially since it's from the Sony verse, right? Yeah. Like, this had the lowest bar set for it. I really hate to say, but the trailers came out. They were wonderful. Sony might have made one of the best Spider Man movies ever. Besides yeah. uh, Spider-Man 2 by Sam Raimi. You know, being that Sony's made all the Spider-Man movies, they have made the best Spider-Man movie ever. Okay. But this one, they might have made, <laughs> whichever one it was, is the best and it's from them. <laughs> but this one might yeah. be the best one. <laughs> so, uh, remember everybody, I told you that this guy has got a channel, so be sure to head on over to his channel, subscribe to that channel, head down into the uh, comment section down below, tell us your full thoughts, let's dive into the whole thing. Thank you guys so much for watching, and keep talking movies too much.